Responsibility to protect is a very interesting doctrine. Uh, if you look into its history, there are two versions of responsibility to protect. Uh, one version was accepted by the General Assembly of the United Nations, I think it was 2005, and uh, it's, uh, it doesn't change existing international law very much. It shifted emphasis. It said there should be a focus on whether states are preserving rights internally. And if they're not, there should be various pressures, uh, efforts to try to induce them to uh, uh, protect and implement the kinds of rights that are, for example, uh, uh, exemplified in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But it very explicitly said that any state action under R2P, Responsibility to Protect, must be in accord with the UN Charter. Okay, and the UN Charter is quite explicit. It gives, uh, it bans the threat or use of force in international affairs uh, with two exceptions. Uh, one uh, under a decision by the Security Council, uh, two under Article 51, uh, which uh, permits a state to uh, use force in self-defense against armed attack. Armed attack, which has a definite meaning in international law, until such time as the Security Council has a right, has a, is able to respond. Okay, those are the conditions. And the R2P in the UN version maintains those. That's the version that the interventionist states appeal to when they talk about the justifications for military intervention. But there's another version, there's another, crucially, uh, that was produced by a commission uh, headed by the uh, former uh, uh, Australian Prime Minister Gareth Evans, it's the Evans Commission, uh, which is, they presented a version of R2P, which is the same as the UN version with one exception. The exception says that in case uh, the United Nations Security Council has not acted uh, to uh, preserve rights, you know, to protect people, uh, organizations may, uh, organizations of states may, in the region of their own responsibility, intervene by force themselves without Security Council authorization, subject to later uh, authorization by uh, the United Nations. Well, which organizations are capable of doing this? Exactly one, NATO. Okay, so what this version says, and, and what is NATO's regional responsibility? Uh, the world, actually that's official. Uh, the, as NATO expanded after the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, it expanded to Eastern Europe as we know, but also beyond. The official mandate for NATO, official, is that it has the authority to protect the global energy system, uh, pipelines, shipping lanes, and so on, which means it can do anything it wants anywhere in the world, okay? So there's one organization, NATO, primarily the US, uh, which under the Evans version has the right to use force unilaterally uh, anywhere it likes in the world, uh, subject to later authorization by the United Nations. That's also called responsibility to protect. So we have two versions. One, the UN version, which shifts the focus of attention but keeps the framework of international law. Two, the Evans Commission version, which grants NATO the right to do whatever it wants. Uh, one of them is the one to which appeal is made when you wanna talk about the justification for R2P. The other is the one that you use when you want to invade Libya or something like that. 
and uh, the political science profession uh, connives in this by uh, failing to distinguish the two different versions. And the two different versions are crucially different in the, exactly the way you'd expect imperial powers to interpret them. That's R2P.